cold and wet night uh, for coming out to the library. And welcome to you Zoomers too. Maybe you had the right idea tonight to stay in where it's warm. But wherever you are at home or here, welcome. Uh, we're going to have a great program. Um, we have some books over here that are related to tonight's program. If you want to check them out before you go home, please do. And um, quickly, I want to tell you about, uh, actually, this is my last program of 2022. So I'll tell everybody Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And um, that being said, I will be here next Tuesday afternoon to show in the movie. We have a movie uh, that we haven't been, we haven't been showing movies until last month you know, pre-COVID. We're showing Elvis, which is the biopic of Elvis Presley. There's only one Elvis, so I guess you figured that out. Um, it's at 2 o'clock on Tuesday the 20th. And I don't, I have, January's jam-packed with really good things, but I don't want to take a lot of time. I'm just going to tell you about the first one in January in detail. It's January 12th uh, at 6.30. It's called uh, the, so it's about self-compassion. Uh, sounds a little strange, but I think most of us try to be compassionate and kind to others, but we're not always so kind to ourselves. So uh, we should motivate ourselves by uh, kindness rather than criticism. And we're going to develop some tools in that program. I think it sounds very interesting and helpful. Uh, in January, we have a calligraphy workshop. We have uh, a program on um, World War II naval battles. Uh, we have a great concert with uh, different genres of jazz. And we have a movie in January where the credits sing, based on a great book. So all the details for those things are in the newsletter and on the website. And I will give more information as we get closer. So, but tonight's program, uh, we're going on a uh, little vacation. A Christmas vacation with Gene Flynn. He's going to take us on a visit to the Christmas markets of Prague and four cities in Germany. And we are going to kind of hang out with the locals and go to these markets and soak up some culture, see the food they eat, and just kind of relax and have a good time. So please welcome Gene Flynn. Thank, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I've been in, I've attended lectures here at the library, so it's a it's a wonderful library. Uh, but I love visiting libraries. Uh, and so tonight we're going to be talking about the Christmas markets in Prague and Germany. Can you hear me in back? Okay, one, wonderful. Uh, so I started giving these kind of lectures by my involvement with the Institute of Continued Learning. Uh, in, at Roosevelt University in Schaumburg. And it's a group for people 55 and older. We have lectures, but more importantly, we have uh, sessions all year long where members uh, learn about art and history and sciences. Uh, I have some brochures here. If, if you're interested in learning more, and, uh, you're, you're most welcome. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about the organization. So tonight, though, we're going to be looking at Christmas markets. Uh, my wife Mary and I, we were, we visited Europe about 18 times uh, in 20 years. And she sang with the Chicago Master Singers. So some of our trips were with the Master Singers, including visiting most of the same towns that I'm talking about tonight. So the trip that we're talking about here was a trip that we took on our own uh, in 2016. And I'll be adding some travel tips along with some history and what we saw on the trip. So, uh, so let's let's begin. Um, now, uh, in the 1980, 1990s and 80s, I worked for computer technology companies. And one of the vice presidents said, I should always be ready to give my talk, even if it's a 25 slide talk, give it in two slides. So here I'm, I'm giving you two slides about Christmas markets. The first one is, Christmas markets are about friends getting together. Uh, it's, it's a great time, and we saw this everywhere we went. Uh, Germany, as you'll see, has an amazing rail system. So high school or college friends or work friends, they could easily gather together to say, let's meet at the Nuremberg Christmas market Saturday at noon. And they could come from 50 miles away or 200 miles away and easily get to Nuremberg to join their friends. The second slide is food. 
you know, uh, they sell a lot of, you know, Christmas ornaments at the Christmas markets, but I think the predominant thing that's sold is food. And, and here we see, you know, first of all, take a look at this booth. They're actually selling waffles. And uh, there's five or six different versions. You could have a waffle with uh, strawberries or blueberries. But look at the booth itself, how, how beautiful it is. Uh, you, you never see chipped paint or peeling paint. Uh, everything is a, a pristine at the Christmas markets. And I think this goes back to the German character. They really take pride in what they do, but they inspect. Somebody, I'm sure, comes around, and if, if they see you know, a peeling paint, they say, fix this, or you cannot open tomorrow. You know, very strict rules. Now, uh, take a look at the woman on the right. She seems perturbed about something. And I suspect it's about the guy on our, our left here. Uh, but we'll never know. But she does look, has, she does have a strange, uh, you know, facial expression. So let's talk, though, not just the two slides. So a little bit of history. Uh, the Christmas markets are known as the Christ, Christkind Mart, which literally means Christ Child Market. But, but uh, people that grew up in Germany tell me the real translation is the spirit of Christmas type market. And, and we saw that everywhere. We saw angels, we, you know, we, uh, it, we saw lots of angels, but it's the spirit of Christmas is the, the kind of the translation uh, for the people today. And these, these date back to the Dresden that had the first market in the 1400s, a one day event. Now the Christmas markets begin the last week of November and they run till noon on December 25th, 24th. At 1201, everything closed down, people go home, and two or three weeks later, they take down all the different booths. But, but it's, it's basically a four week, four and a half week event. Over 3,000 Christmas markets in Germany alone, and it's about a, over $3 billion in sales. And in 2022, this year, it's back to the full Christmas market experience. Uh, in 2020, they basically canceled them all. In 2021, they had limited capacity for, for markets. So this is the first year they're back to uh, the full experience. So here, uh, here we see this is uh, directly off the, uh, the Munich uh, Christmas market website last week, you know, showing all the angels, the spirit of Christmas. So. I, I, here's a little bit, a little rundown on the trip that we took. Uh, we flew to Munich, uh, and this was a 13-day trip, by the way. We flew to Munich, spent two days at the Christmas markets and in Munich. Then we took a train to Nuremberg and spent three days in Nuremberg. We went to Frankfurt by train to fly to Prague and spent three days in Prague. We flew back uh, to Frankfurt and then we took a, a train to Cologne and spent three days in Cologne and then flew home. Uh, so this is equivalent, if, if we only talk about the German side, it's equivalent to going from Chicago to Detroit and perhaps down to Indianapolis, back to Detroit and then back to Chicago. Now, if, if we were thinking in the US logic of those cities, we'd be traveling, you know, you know, spending three full days traveling. Europe, it's entirely different. Europe has an amazing train system uh, that is just wonderful to move from city to city. And for example, here's a, here's a concrete example. Um, when we got to Munich, our hotel was five minutes from the train station. You know, so we landed at the airport, took the, like the Metro type train, to downtown Munich at the main train station. Uh, our hotel was nearby. The Christmas markets was a 10 minute walk from our hotel. So on the Saturday, we were leaving Munich to go to Nuremberg. So we could leave our hotel at 1040 in the morning. We get to the train station by 11, you know, five minutes later, we'd be on a new, uh, an 11 o'clock train We'd get to Nuremberg, our hotel was right near the train station, and we'd be in the Nuremberg Christmas market 
uh, 20 minutes later. Now, now, if we were flying, you know, in the US logic, you'd have to get to the airport two hours early, you'd, you'd, then you'd have to get down to the central part of the city. Europeans travel by train as much as, as, much as they possibly can. And the trains are fast, they're inexpensive, and they run very, very regularly. So it's, it's really a, 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 a pleasure to travel, but it means some trade-offs. So we follow the Rick Steves advice and would rather stay at a two-star hotel near the train station than a three or four-star hotel that's away from the train station and away from the sites that we wanna see. So that's how Europeans travel and we try to you know, model our travel after the European style. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Munich. Uh, as I planned this trip, I had two concerns. The first one was, would we have to bring snowshoes and snow boots and you know, how much snow might we have in early December? And as we got closer to leaving, it became clear that it might be cold, it might be low 30s at night, but snow would not be a big issue. There might be an inch of snow some time or another, but we, you know, it's not gonna be four or five inches of snow where we'd, we'd have to pack heavy snow gear. Uh, my second concern is, what would we do all day? I didn't, I, I had trouble envisioning spending eight hours at the Christmas market. Now, some people might shop for eight hours, but you know, it, it didn't seem like the best option. Fortunately, if you're at a hotel near the Christmas market, you can go back and forth, you know, visit the Christmas market for a couple hours in the morning, you know, do something else in the afternoon or just hang out at the hotel and then come back at the evening. And so that's what we did at each of these cities. And in Munich, there's lots of things to do. Uh, you know, on, particularly on past trips, I've, I've spent time in Munich and visiting some of the, some of the important sites. And one place to go that I've enjoyed in the past is the Museum of Science and Technology. This, this, is a, this is a huge complex. It's like our Museum of Science and Industry. It's like, uh, you know, you can add on the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, and it, it has it all. Uh, so you could easily spend, you know, two hours or 10 hours at this facility the BMW Museum is right across the street as well. But uh, at the Science and Technology Museum, uh, they have a wonderful group of halls that cover aviation. And uh, I enjoyed this call very much. At the top, they have the Wright Brothers plane. But I really enjoyed you know, studying that plane on the right, the red plane. That's a World War I fighter plane, like the Red Baron flew. And, and when I did a little, you know, you know it, it looks small physically there, but when I looked it up on Wikipedia, this plane is about the length of a Toyota Camry. I mean, incredibly small. And, and the, the sides of the plane and the wings are made of a flammable material over cloth. It's not, it's not a metal plane. I mean, so this is dangerous, even if, uh, you know, the planes caught fire, even if they weren't shot at by the enemy, this is very, very dangerous to, uh, it, it, you, it, without a parachute, if, if the plane catches fire, uh, unless you land quickly, you'll, you'll burn to death. It's no wonder they spent the nights drinking. So uh, here we are back at Munich, here back at the Christmas market. Uh, on the right, you see Mary and I, I'm holding a, a cup of warmed wine. That is the traditional drink at the Christmas market. Now, lots of treats uh, everywhere you turn. Uh, there's treats and uh, sausages, uh, but there are rules in Germany at these Christmas markets. And I think for every 20 booths that have food and uh, high calorie food, you have to have one healthy booth. So, so everywhere you'd see, there'd be a, a booth selling oranges and apples. Now, nobody was buying the oranges and apples, but it was there, you know, they were, they followed the rules. Uh, a lot of times there wasn't even in, anybody in there to sell, uh, sell anything. But lots of, these are, and these are not toys. There's lots of, there, there are toys that you can buy, but these are serious little, uh, you know, this is an orchestra that you can purchase. 
uh, each of these little figures are 10 to $15. And uh, so this whole set with the organ at the top, that's probably $400, $500. Uh, so, but notice they're angels. Each of these performers is a little angel because that's part of the theme. Uh, it's, you, you may, many of you have probably been to the downtown Christmas market here in Chicago. My estimate is the Christmas markets in Munich and Nuremberg are, are 50 to 60 times larger than the market in downtown Chicago. It's just enormous. Uh, here we have, this is the, uh, the city hall at Munich, and you see a little portion of the Christmas market here because the buildings are, get in the way. Uh, the city hall alone is a marvel too uh, because of the clock tower and the, the uh, uh, the displays every hour, the, the clock tower changes and has a, a kind of a musical act. Uh, so there's a huge plaza here with the Christmas markets, all the side streets. Off on the left is the cathedral with the twin towers. Another huge Christmas market this, uh, section there as well. So just these are just enormous. Uh, here is a cathedral. This is the Catholic cathedral. Uh, and Inside uh, is, uh, it's, it's nice to wander in because it's beautiful artwork. And uh, we've been to many cathedrals in Europe. And in Germany, most of the churches, they have wooden statues rather than marble or stone. Because of the history of German craftsmen uh, for woodworking, th that's typically highlighted in the, uh, in the churches. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's nice also because you can get out of the cold for, you know, it, it, even at 35 or 38 degrees, it gets cold if you're out there for an hour or two. Uh, here, is, uh, uh, here is a Christmas market. This is daytime. It's, it's quite different at night with all the lights. But on the left, we see the Clydesdale horses that uh, you can have a ride on uh, uh, in the carriage. And on the right here, we see the crowds uh, at, at during the day, and at night, it's even more crowded, typically. And, uh, and this was a, a kind of a different experience for us because you had to kind of push your way through the crowd nicely. It, you, know, if, you can't wait for the crowd to open up because you, you'd wait forever. So you, you nicely kind of have to squeeze through the crowd. And everyone seemed to be in good humor. Nobody was saying, uh, stop pushing. Um, but the, what was different for us is in the summertime when we've been to Munich, we have the impression that the German leaders tell their people, be kind to the lost tourists, particularly the Americans, help them out. Uh, because if we've stood in a corner with a map in the summertime, two or three people will come up and, and they'll almost compete with each other to say, who will be the ones that help us? Well, at the Christmas markets, the vast majority of the people are Germans and locals. And you know, so they don't have to be on the lookout for lost tourists. Now, I'm sure somebody would help us if we said we're lost, but, but they're not on the lookout for, they're, they're just there and having a good time. Uh, lots, again, lots of things to buy. And, and part of the theme is they want quality things that are sold. And, and I'll talk more about that on the next slide. But the guy on the right, uh, he has, the, these are furs, uh, and I didn't see any price tags, or, or not even clear what he's selling. Is it just you know, furs that you put on the floor or on the wall? But uh, I'm sure this is very high-end merchandise. And, uh, and here we see some stained glass uh, ornaments and uh, items for sale on the right. On the left, we have these little, you know, villages and little houses that you might put a candle in. And, and you could go to a local dollar store here and see something that looks a little like this. But, uh, but it, my, it, my impression is at these markets, they are very careful. They do not want low cost imported things from Asia. You know, they want quality things that are sold in limited edition uh, and also there's no deals. You know, you, know, you know, we have an American marketing logic that often says buy one or buy two and get one free. The, you know, the Europeans don't look at marketing that way. Uh, my experience is if, if one of these uh, little buildings costs $15, 
if you want three of them, that's $45. You know, the, you don't, you know, there's no questions of deals or negotiating. Uh, it, the price is as the price is. Now on, uh, on Saturday, you know, two days after Munich, we, we uh, hopped on the train, again, arriving at the train station 20 minutes early, plenty of time to get down to our, the track that we need to be on. Uh, it was loaded with party goals. It was standing room only. And because it was Saturday, a lot of people that were off work, uh, particularly young people in their 20s, and uh, they were on their way to Munich, I think, to meet other friends. Uh, and it was a 75-mile trip. It was less than an hour, even with many stops. So, so this train was going 125, 150 miles an hour much of the time during that, uh, during that one hour trip. Once we got to Nuremberg, uh, it was, our hotel was right across the street from the train station. We did a 10 minute walk and from, the train, from our hotel to the Christmas market. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the uh, one part of the Nuremberg market. And take a look at the buildings around this section of the market, how picturesque they are. Now, now Nuremberg claims to be the largest market, Christmas market in Germany. Uh, but you know, Munich was also very, very large. But my impression is that Nuremberg, they put their whole heart and soul into the Christmas market. Uh, Munich is a big city, million and a half people. They have the Oktoberfest, you know, that is a huge effort in September. M my impression is Nuremberg people think about this year round, how can they have the best Christmas market possible? Uh, and it, uh, and it, it shows the pride and the quality of what they do. Um, in, in Nuremberg, they have these wonderful sausages called the Nuremberg sausage. And, and we've been there in the summertime and, 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 uh, and if you go to casual dining in Germany, not, you know, not fine dining restaurant, but in casual dining, you, they usually just sit you with a bunch of people that are already there, you know, at, at long tables. So, uh, so if you sit down at the table, uh, you could order, you know, three or six sausages, perhaps, and there are rolls on the table. And if you take a roll, uh, you just take that and then they charge you an extra 30 or 40 cents if you take a roll. Uh, at the Christmas markets, you want to have a roll because you're basically walking around. There's there, there's very little tables or chairs at the Christmas market. Most of them, there's none at all. Uh, so so you want to have a roll to hold your sausages. Uh, and they also serve the wine this that I mentioned, the Luke wine. And I love wine, but the warmed wine really wasn't to my my taste. So I I, I did have it a couple times. But I wanted to have a couple of the extra, a couple extra cups that the wine comes in. And, and at the Christmas market, you pay seven euros for the, for the wine, the cup with wine. And then you pay five euros if you wanted to refill the wine. So it's, it's basically a $2 deposit that you can get back if you return the cup. So I went to the booth and I said, could I just buy a couple cups for two euros? And they said, fine. And they looked them over carefully. They, they, these, these, most of these cups are used year after year, but the, the, the workers looked them over to make sure it was not only pristine and that there was no fading of the color. So they gave me two wonderful cups that, uh, uh, that I still have. Uh, 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 in Nuremberg, the, the Christmas market, again, it's in multiple sections. It's all interconnected, but, but there's two or three large plazas that, that house the Christmas market. And again, 40, 50 times larger than the Chicago market. Uh, here, we have wonderful music that we see on the left. And, uh, and these performers could be from Nuremberg proper, or they might be from towns and villages 30 or 40 or 50 miles away that can come in and perform, but I am sure they are auditioned, that they have to qualify to perform. You just can't say, we, we are a good band, can we come? You have to, I'm sure, give tapes or you know, YouTube videos that demonstrate your quality. Uh, here, again, wonderful artwork in, inside the, 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 the cathedral. And this is the cathedral, this is the Catholic cathedral, it dates back to the 1300s in Nuremberg. 
uh, we see uh, the ornaments there, hand carved ornaments on the left. This is a, a repeat of the slide that's showing, again, this is crowded. Uh, on the left, we see this worker preparing uh, a, a Nutella uh, with, uh, with this wheat device, this wheat was surrounded by Nutella. Now, Nutella is a chocolate and peanut butter concoction. So they sell it here, but it's very, very popular in Europe. And the European Union tried to ban it a couple of years ago because there's, they said there's so little nutritional value. It's basically all sugar. So they tried to ban it, but there was such an uproar. They said, okay, we'll allow Nutrella to live. Uh, and at night, as you walk towards the Christmas market, they have these angels hanging from the buildings so that you know you're heading to the Christmas market. Now, on a previous trip, we were in Nuremberg with Mary's group, the Chicago Master Singers. And uh, uh, we had two hours free. So uh, somebody told us, go to the railway museum in right there near the hotel because in two hours you can see the see the museum some of the other museums you you know you'd need four or five hours to even begin to appreciate it so so we wandered through this museum and it was and indeed you could see it all in two hours and they cover the history of the railways in uh germany and and they talked about the trade-off that they made in Germany versus the U.S., because in the U.S., when we were building the railroads rapidly in the 1850s and 1860s, we wanted high-speed trains, and we wanted trains that you could build quickly, locomotives. And much as the steamboats on the Mississippi, if they blew up from time to time, that was okay. You know, we, 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 we realized you, you, you're not going to cut quality and safety and speed and uh, and low cost. The Germans had a different attitude. They wanted they wanted safety and quality, even though the, their locomotives probably cost three times as much to make as the American locomotives. That was the trade off they made. So we wandered through this museum and saw their whole history. But as I wandered through, I kept looking and I wondered, are they going to talk about the fact that in World War II? the German train system took 6 million people to the death camps, to their death. Would they cover this or, or ignore it? Well, there were, it turned out they covered it. So we found a hall that just covered this. And, and they told the story. They had cars that, you know, the, the cars that were used to transport the, the, uh, uh, the victims uh, to, the, you know, to the death camps. And they made the point that many died right on the car itself because there was, you know, some some people were taking five and six day trips on these cars without real food or water. But at the end of the war, the, the executives of the rail system said, we had no idea that we were taking people to their death. We thought we were just bringing them to labor camps and work camps. Well, with a little research, it was clearly uncovered that they knew exactly what they were doing. They were working hand and fist with hand in hand with uh, the Nazis to, uh, to perpetrate the Holocaust. So, so they, uh, they owned up to the uh, tragedy that represented and the, and the railroads part in their tragedy. Uh, Nuremberg has many other things to do. So Mary and I did spend uh, four hours at this museum, the German National Museum. And this is an enormous museum uh, that covers all of prehistoric times in Germany to modern times. You could spend five days here and only see half of the museum. So, but we did spend on this this trip. We did spend uh, we did spend a couple hours here. Uh, there's many other museums in Nuremberg. Nuremberg is a central location in Germany, and it has wonderful train connections to other to all directions in Germany, which is why Adolf Hitler selected it for his Nuremberg rallies, where you know, 70, 80,000 people would come for a day long rally, and then they'd go home and another 70,000 people would come the next day for these massive rallies. So, so Nuremberg played that role because of its, uh, its, its trained logistics. There's other museums that cover the Nazi period, that covers the, Nazi, uh, the Nuremberg trial period. So there's lots of things to do in Nuremberg besides the Christmas market. 
So, uh, so after our days in Nuremberg, we, we took a train to Frankfurt and we flew to Prague. And, and one of the beauties of traveling in Europe now, first of all, it's the train systems that uh, can allow you to move around quickly. But secondly, you can also fly from country to country very easily. So we flew from Frankfurt to Prague round trip on the Czech national airlines for about $60 a person. So, so that means you know, that you could, you know, if you're in Germany and you wanna visit Greece, if you wanna visit Scandinavia, you, you can move around Europe uh, and see a different part very, very easily, which is nice to do, particularly if you're retired, uh, because it's a hassle to fly over there. Why not stay an extra week and see a different part of Europe? So here we have the Old Town Square in Prague. And, and we actually stayed at a hotel in the Old Town. This was the one city where we were away from the, the central trains, you know, cent, uh, central train station. So on the right, we have, a, uh, these are high school students that are on a trip uh, and, you know, spending the day at the Christmas market by the, by the tree. Uh, but on the left, it's interesting uh, because this is a huge statue of John Huss. And, and John Huss uh, is near and dear to the people of Prague. He was a Catholic priest, uh, and he came up with these ideas that the bishops thought were very radical. And the ideas were people should be able to read the Bible in their native language. And the other, you know, uh, one of his other ideas is people should receive communion on a regular basis. Uh, in this time period, people typically receive communion once or twice a year. And he said people should do it every week. Well, the bishops did not like his ideas, and they burnt him at the stake right here. And they also collected all his writings under threat of death or, or uh, uh, going to hell. You had to turn in all your writings of John Huss. So they collected them all and burnt those as well. Well, this is about 100 years before Martin Luther. You know, he, he was born about 100 years before Martin Luther. So Martin Luther, in his adulthood, he had basically these same ideas, plus a few dozen more. But shortly after Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the Wittenberg Cathedral door, his writings were in the hands of thousands of people because the movable type printing press had been arrived in Europe in, that, in these intertweening years from John Huss to Martin Luther. And, and China had these movable type printing presses for hundreds of years, but it arrived in Europe. So there were tens of thousands of copies of the German Bible and, and Martin Luther's ideas were spread far and wide. And they also came back to Prague because you know, the, the ideas that John Huss had, the people of Prague were very early in adopting the, the Reformation ideas. Uh, with wonderful food in Prague. We, uh, Mary and I are not fine diners. We often ate pub food, but there was a wonderful French restaurant next to our hotel. And, and we were in a wonderful hotel that Rick Steves recommended, the Hostel Hotel. And, uh, and it, it was a family owned hotel. It was 1920s decor. It had the old cage elevator that would only hold two people in a, in a small luggage. Uh, and it, when you came back at night, uh, in the reception area, there was chairs with tea and uh, complimentary glasses of wine. So you could just sit and talk and relax and talk to uh, other guests. Uh, here, uh, this is the town center. Uh, and that's the, the, this is the Protestant, uh, the Protestant uh, uh, cathedral or main church. That, and that's called the Hussite Church. Uh, and in the U.S., they're, they're called the Moldovian Christian churches. There are several Moldovian churches in the Chicago area, but that's from the Czech, the, 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 you know, those are people from the Czech uh, Republic. That's their national church in, in, Czechoslov uh, in the, the Czech Republic. Here is, the, uh, the, here is a bird's eye view of their Christmas market. The huge statues of John Huss is on the left. Straight ahead is the Catholic cathedral. So that's in the same, right in the same area. Uh, but the, the Christmas market in Prague 
uh, it might have been six or seven times bigger than the downtown Chicago market. So quite a bit smaller than Munich or uh, Nuremberg, but still lots of fun. You know, people were having a good time. Uh, in, uh, in Prague, they have a, an important, this is the, uh, the Charles Bridge, uh, which in the summertime, the Charles Bridge is loaded with muse musicians and tourists. That uh, it's, it's one of the central points to the tourists want to visit. Uh, because they have wonderful musicians. As you walk along every 50 yards, there's another musical group with the, uh, with the violin case open. That's how they're earning their living. Uh, there was only one set of musicians there uh, the December while we were there. But off in the distance, you see the Royal Palace of Prague. And, and the king would, could live there, and he would come across this bridge if he wanted to get to the old town center, the center of Prague, uh, but otherwise the king uh, would stay up at the castle. And, and here we see the Prague castle complex. It's believed to be the largest castle complex in the world. It's just enormous between the residents of the, uh, of, of the king or the duke, whoever, you know, the king, there wasn't always a king here. Sometimes it was a duke that was in charge of, of uh, Prague. But uh, he would reside here. He's an enormous uh, basilica there. Uh, there was an army barracks. There was offices. Uh, and in 1618, there was a, 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 an important event here because the king or the duke was staunchly Catholic. And Prague had, if not totally converted to Reformation logic under, you know, like the Martin Luther logic, Many of the people were, and uh, particularly the middle class and the shop owners and the craftsmen, and they were protesting outside the castle because two envoys from the Pope were coming to the Prague castle. And they rushed in and took these two envoys from the Pope and threw them to their death, threw them out the window to their death. But they didn't die. And one side said angels caught them in midair and brought them to, to safety. Uh, the more likely reality is they fell on a, a piles of manure uh, and, and you know, broke their fall and they lived. But uh, apart from these two guys that lived, this triggered, Europe at the time was a powder keg ready to explode. And, and what occurred is the 30 years war where, where you know, Catholic armies in, you know, some from France and other parts of Germany, and Protestant armies were roaming the countrysides, uh, destroying farmland and destroying towns. So if they came to us, if they came, if one army came to a town of the other religion, they'd destroy the town. And upwards of eight million people died during this thirty years, half of which just from starvation. It was just an enormous, uh, enormous tragedy. And the idea of people of different religions getting along, it, it really hadn't arrived yet. Uh, it, it arrived a little earlier in France than other parts of Europe, where the French king, uh, Francois I, said, we need to get along to people. And uh, we, we, you know, we, we have to be French first and then tolerate each other. We don't have to like each other, but we should tolerate each other. It, it, this took Europe a long time to get this, get that right. Uh, here, uh, like, here we have a crowd on the left heading to the Charles Bridge, now, uh, even in December, there are some tour groups. Uh, there are some riverboat groups that uh, are are visiting Prague. On the right is a, a part of the Charles University, named after King Charles, uh, who and this dates back to the 1300s as a university. We wanted to go to the top of this uh, bell tower uh, for a wonderful view, but the elevator wasn't working, so instead. We went to the manger museum that was on the first floor. And here it was warm, which was nice to, to warm up. And they had 30 or 35 mangers dis displays, some from highly skilled craftspeople and others from you know, beginning craftspeople. But, but you saw a whole range of, of wonderful, uh, wonderful mangers. It was also a great place to buy some ornaments to bring home as gifts. And uh, we... Uh, they sold these flat ornaments that, that you could have 10 or 15 ornaments in the size of like a, 
a, a 12 inch, you know, a 12 ounce can of pop. You know, so you could you could easily pack. Um, sometimes people have asked us, well, we travel light. We travel with a basically a carry on suitcase, even if we're going into Europe for two or three weeks. And people say, well, how can you, you know, will you be able to buy gifts? And we've learned not to buy a lot of gifts. The first time Mary and I were in, we were in Italy and we spent hours and hours looking for the perfect gift for the new child of Mary's niece. Little Sam was 18 months old. We wanted the perfect gift. And we finally found this wonderful Pinocchio hand carved and you could turn his nose and it, it was a music box. Well, guess what was in their garage sale a year later? Little Pinocchio for one dollar, and and uh, Mary's niece said, "How did this get into the garage?" Say, well, she put it there. It had a, it had the sticker on it. So, yeah, but you know it, that was an important lesson to us not to you know you know that we could travel like we don't have to worry about bringing back gifts. And we wound up well. We'll bring back little things. We'll bring back chocolate or consumable. But you know, shopping for the nieces and nephews stuff the stuff they probably don't even appreciate. Uh, you know, let's, you know, so we, that was very opening, very freeing for us. But uh, here in Prague, uh, the wonderful music at night and, and during the day, they had school kids here with uh, teachers talking about Prague values and uh, Czech values. Uh, you know, the, uh, the teachers were often dressed in, a, uh, in an outfit that would remind you of rural Prague, uh, you know, back uh, like we do with kids with uh, Abe Lincoln and the you know, the uh, living in a, a, a log cabin. Prague is an incredibly beautiful city. The, the buildings, not, not just in this, you know, it's, it's not just eight or 10 blocks. It seems like all of central Prague is wonderful buildings that date back to the uh, 1800s that are there and well-preserved. They had very little physical damage from World War II. Uh, a couple of times, American bombers that were trying to bomb a German city 80 miles north were off course and they dropped some bombs here. It did not do much, a lot of damage. The, the damage to Prague was the 70 or 80,000 Jews that were taken to death camps and that did not return. Uh, Prague was a, an amazing city for the Jewish populations in the 1930s. They were very well accepted. They were leaders in law and education and medicine. You know, anti-Semitism was much less present in Prague than most other European cities. Uh, but that, you know, all the skills and the, the roles they had did not matter. They were, they were taken to the death camps. Uh, here's Prague Airport. We're flying back, flying back to Germany. And the next morning, we, we stayed at a hotel in Frankfurt. And the next morning, we, we arrived in Cologne. Uh, and this was special to us, and our, this was our favorite Christmas market, even though it wasn't the largest. Uh, we had been to Nuremberg and Munich in the past. This was the first time in Cologne, and, and we really enjoyed it. Uh, the first thing I'd want to point out with this picture is uh, the train stations in the main train stations in Germany, and, and somewhat in France. They're much more than a train station. Uh, the, first of all, it, it had a hotel, and uh, we stayed at the hotel here. It, on the left side, you see a three-story brownish earth tone building. That is a hotel, and you, you enter the hotel from within the train station, uh, but, uh, uh, but in this train station, they have fast food, they have fine dining, they have supermarkets. They, uh, they don't. I didn't see a, a furniture store, but essentially anything else that you wanted to buy, you could buy right at the train station. And and you might it might be hard to notice, but over on the right side, you see uh, stores. It says Hermes and Dior. So Christian Dior, the 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 high end clothing designer, has a store here. I mean, so, you know, everything you could possibly want is right in the train station itself. So, and directly across the street was the cathedral, and, and next to the cathedral was the Christmas market. So, here, here we have the cathedral at Cologne. Uh, this was finished in the 1470s. It was the largest building in Europe north of the Alps. 
So St. Peter's in Rome was larger, but this was the, you know, the second largest building in Europe. Uh, I, I like the picture on the left. That's a, one of the previous cardinals. And he clearly designed his own you know, uh, sarcophagus or uh, his uh, tombstones. Because if you, if you let your successors design it, you're not going to get, you're going to get something fairly boring. But to here, he wanted to make a statement. That's an angel at his side. So, uh, so there, there we have a, a, a cardinal with a sense of humor. Here's what the cathedral and uh, this area looked like in, at the end of World War II. So the cathedral survived. There were, there were bombs that fell through the roof. And Cologne was bombed repeatedly during World War II. It was much closer to England uh, than Munich. Uh, so so they, there was bombings in Cologne, uh, it, it, probably beginning in 1942, where Munich and some of the other areas were much farther away, but C Cologne was regularly bombed throughout the war. And in the upper left, you see the, a bridge that's been destroyed the, the railroad bridge was also destroyed. But if you look at the buildings around the cathedral, the vast majority of them are just a shell with just walls, that the roof and all the floors have been destroyed. This had to be essentially rebuilt from scratch. Uh, here we see the Christmas market, part of the, one part of the Christmas market, which is right next to the cathedral. And and this had had some buildings before World War II, but they decided let's create a larger plaza for after uh, after the war, so they could hold events like the Christmas market. Uh, here's a bird's eye view: uh, the cathedral, the the Rhine River behind it, the river making a turn, uh, and then you see the Christmas market there as well. On the right, this is a four-story, you know, temporary building. Uh, with the, with like a candle windmill feature, and here they're selling the warmed wine. So this is the the the, the largest warm wine section uh, at this particular Christmas market. Uh, at night, the colors and the lights you know change the ambience very very nicely. Um, and there's a controversy right now this week and this month because with the power shortage because of the Ukraine war and the the, the Russians cutting back on the fuel, uh, they, they don't, they're short of heat and electricity. And uh, so the government has said, maybe we should turn off the lights at the Christmas markets. And the, and the vendors say, oh, if, you, if we don't have the lights at night, we might as well close. It, it's so important to the Christmas market. Uh, here is a, uh, this was a special treat that we had. Um, this is a, uh, these guys here on the left, are from Switzerland, and they have this special Swiss cheese called raclette cheese. And it's a it's a hard cheese, but when you heat it up, and this guy has a big wheel of the cheese, and he's scraping off some cheese, and then they put it in a uh, they they heat it up, and it will uh, it becomes then it will uh, you can pour it onto. In this case, they poured it on that slice of uh, a baguette that was sliced in half. So Mary is holding the, the, the bread with cheese, and there's probably seven ounces of cheese on that baguette. We had them slice it in half. That would make a wonderful lunch or a mid-afternoon snack. And uh, so, and it's, it's not like fondue that pours, it, it kind of it oozes off the, the little heater. And, and we have friends that have had us over to their house for a raclette dinner. And, and this is the device that they had, this type of device. So the logic of the raclette dinner is you have this grill on the top. So the, uh, on e either side of these are, are raclette devices. So you grill your steak or your chicken and your vegetables on, on the top. And on the lower level, you have your raclette cheese that's also heated up. There's a little heater under the cheese. So, so you can take your veggies and put them on your plate and then pour some of your, you know, from your raclette holder onto your veggies and then later onto your chicken or beef. And that's part of the raclette dinner experience. It's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful experience. 
very few stores sell raclette cheese. I'm told that Whole Foods sells it from time to time. And last week at a lecture, somebody said at the Aurora Christmas market, they do have this very experience of the raclette cheese on bread. So uh, if there's still time to get down to Aurora. Uh, here we have, uh, here crepes and other, uh, other food being prepared. But, you know, it, wonderful booth. Everything is pristine. Uh, I'm sure many of these workers, you know, they're dealing with syrups and uh, strawberry sauce. I'm sure th they get their smock dirty from time to time, but there's more in the background. You never see a, a, a worker with a dirty outfit. They, you know, they, they take great pride. I'm sure there's half a dozen more smocks back there that they can put on. Uh, here's a booth. This is a booth from Finland and they're selling craft preserves and honey from Finland. So they, it's, other countries are welcome, but you have to bring quality stuff. Wonderful music again here, at, uh, everywhere we turned. This, here they had a bigger stage and a larger, larger, music, larger number of musicians. Um, now, uh, Cologne has a wonderful experience and a history of beer. You know, all Germany has great beer. But in Cologne, they have a special type of beer called Klush. And we went to the brew pub of this company, this one company, and the brewery is actually 10 miles away, but they had, this is their brew pub restaurant. And uh, so you sit down and uh, here on the right, uh, we, the first time we ate there twice, we liked it so much. Uh, the first day we had a sausage plate and then a cheese plate. And that was far too much food. The second day we could just order the sausage plate and that was more than enough for lunch. Because you're eating, you're eating at the Christmas markets as well. I mean, so this is not your, you know, this is not your only meal of the day. But the beer itself is very interesting. It's uh, the it looks like a Pilsner beer, like a Budweiser or Miller's beer, but it's brewed in a different way. So I'm told that the Pilsner beers you have the yeast on the bottom of this big vat that you know that might be brewing uh, 200 gallons of beer. But for Klosh beer, it's a different type of yeast, and the yeast is at the top of the of the brewing system. So it gives it a different flavor. So this guy in the middle was our server, one of the servers, and he walks around with this aluminum tray. And if he sees that your glass is empty, and these are small glasses, these are six ounce glasses, 200 milliliters. So if your glass is empty, he'll pick up your glass, put a new one down, and he'll mark on your coaster that you've had one more beer. And if you are finished drinking, uh, you just put your coaster on top of your beer glass, and he knows not to bring another one. Uh, in Cologne, there's actually five or six different Christmas markets. We went to four of them, and one of them is down by the Rhine River. So they, these are where the you know the river boats come in. We have friends that are uh, that have been on the river boat. They just got back from their trip, and so their river boat would have stopped here. And they would have walked to the Christmas market and taken other tours with the with the riverboat company. And and here is the Christmas market at the uh, what they call the Chocolate Museum. So the Chocolate Museum is built on what was an an industrial pier back when this was a a, a factory area of Cologne, but now it's still part of it's part of the uh, the tourist area. And so. Uh, so there's a little Christmas market, but then you can walk in and this is a, they have a mini factory from the Lint Chocolate Company. And uh, here it's a, uh, it's a full factory that shows all the processes of making chocolate, but on a very small scale. So, you know, so a real factory would have been, you know, probably six times larger equipment and everything. But, the, but you walk through this and at the end, they give you a sample of the Lint Chocolate. The next day we went to the St. Nicholas Market uh, and we, we just hopped on a tram from the central train station, which, which was right outside our hotel. You know, we, you know, we walked out of our hotel, got on the tram. It took us to the Rudolph Plaza. And uh, here, there we have a couple of welcoming angels on the left, part of the information booth. You know, notice it's in English. Every, you know, Europeans, 
uh, and then the Germans, they, uh, they having things in English is part of their culture. It's in France, they like everything in the French language. They're very particular. The Germans and the Italians, you know, they'll put as much as in English as in their own language because, you know, English is the language of the international travelers. Uh, lots of, this was a Saturday, lots of families here. Here's a puppet show on the left. Uh, again, food. Germans do not worry about calories during the Christmas market. I'm not sure they worry about calories any time of the year, but clearly at the Christmas markets, you, you see you know, people just enjoying the wonderful food. And all day long, they keep refilling, the, uh, refilling this. At night, a whole different ambiance. Again, this is back, this is at the main Christmas market. Now, the next day, we took a side trip to a, the town of Aachen. And this was on my list uh, to get to. When I first, you know, 12 years ago, I joined the Institute of Continued Learning, which, which uh, I have the brochures. And I was in a class led by the guy, Bob Allen. And he was talking about mid, middle, medieval Europe. And he said, has anyone been to Aachen? You know, there were 40 people in the room and five hands went up. People had been to Aachen. And so I wanted, I, I really wanted to get here. So Aachen was the capital of Charlemagne in, uh, in, in the 700s. You know, the Rome fell in like 450 and there was just chaos. The, the central control of Europe out of Rome had fallen apart. So for you know, for so th for three hundred years, there was very little. There was almost no central control across Europe. Everything was just you know, every little town had to look after themselves. Well, Charlemagne was able to, with his army, was able to pull together, and so he was the the supreme ruler of France, Germany, Austria. You know, you know the Czech Republic area, and. The Pope needed his help to keep peace in Italy, so he'd go down there with his army to bring peace to Italy. So, so he was a central, he was the unified ruler from this time period up until now the European Union. This is the first time they've had another kind of quasi-central control in Europe. So in 796, he, he started to, he wanted to build a chapel, a special chapel, and it's called the Palatine Chapel. And, and I live in your neighboring town of Palatine, Illinois. And, and Palatine, Illinois was founded by German farmers in the 1850s that came from this region of Germany that was the Palatine region of Germany. So here we have, uh, here we have the Palatine Chapel. It's amazing. It's, it's, first of all, it's amazing. It survived. It's 1,200 years. It's still there. Uh, it's gold uh, mosaics and gold leaf on the walls. It's not painted gold, it's real gold. And my pictures do not do it justice, but, but just incredibly beautiful uh, and standing uh, 1,200 years later. Uh, so we visited that for about oh, an hour. Then we walked outside. There was a little Christmas market, and then there was a cathedral, but we, we just kind of peeked in the cathedral. We had really already been cathedraled out on the trip. Uh, and so we went back to the train station and there was a wonderful Italian restaurant next door. So we had a wonderful Italian lunch before we took the train back to Cologne. So uh, the next day was our last day in Cologne. And uh, this was our last full day. And uh, here we have the, the, the plaza in front of the cathedral. And the picture on the left is a woman with her two dachshunds. So Mary and I have had two dachshunds, Maggie and Molly, that have, have since passed away. But it's the national dog of Germany, but the Germans have given up on the, the beautiful little dachshund. We, we rarely see them in Germany. And, and when we do, they're usually from people that don't, are not German. This woman's Italian. So she came to Cologne, brought her two dogs with her. So maybe out in the suburbs, the dachshunds are in family homes, but we saw more golden doodles and, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Irish setters, big dogs. We did not see the little dachshund. So uh, th that was our last uh, day. The next morning, we took a, a, the high-speed train from Cologne back to Frankfurt and, and flew home. 
So th this was a wonderful 13 day trip. Uh, and you could easily visit the Christmas markets in Germany in seven days. You don't have to be there 13 days, uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful place to visit. Um, I do this trip and this presentation in memory of Mary. So we lost Mary this last February. Uh, she had a rare muscle condition uh, that it destroyed her lungs and uh, her breathing, uh, but uh, she loved to travel. And her message to people is travel when you're young uh, and travel in Europe first, because in Europe, it's you, you, the train, particularly in Italy. We love Italy. It's wonderful. But the elevators and the escalators don't always work in Italy. In Germany, they almost always work. But 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 in Italy, they don't always work. But it's, Italy is it's a wonderful place to visit. But do that early. U.S. travel is so much more predictable. You're often using a car that, you know, at the airports, the elevators always work in the U.S. It's, it's easy to travel in the U.S. It's more, you know, more difficult. But uh, so she loves to travel and she that was her advice to people. You pack light and have good shoes and enjoy yourself. So thank you very much. Any questions or comments from here in the room or from our friends on Zoom? Are they, will they come in? On, can they ask questions on chat? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so anything in the room? Any questions or comments in the room? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, how much were the hotels typically, and how much were the museum entry fees? Okay. Very question. The, the hotels, the, the hotels were, were typically around a hundred, a hundred and twenty dollars a night. You know, quite, quite reasonable. But again, these are not three and four star hotels. These are the, uh, these are like Holiday Inn level hotels, but uh, but quite reasonable. They often had a one. Sometimes they had a breakfast uh, included, or for a modest fee, you could have a wonderful breakfast. The museums were very inexpensive. You know, they, uh, I, I'm you know less than twenty dollars for uh, any of the museums that we went to. Yes. Quick little travel to that I found for Germany. I was in Berlin right after the ball came out, and I wanted to walk in my hotel to the wall. And it was obviously pre internet. And I'm looking at the map, and the street names change like every four or five blocks. So I got the bus number you could take to get, and we don't have to know any other language, just follow the number. And it's worked work out in other cities. <laughs> At the, at the fall of the crisp of the Berlin Wall. And uh, the streets can be confusing because the streets names can change every two or three blocks. But if you know the bus number to get on, that, that's really valuable. And, and that's one of the values. We follow Rick Steves' advice a great deal because there's many wonderful books on what you can do in each of these cities. But Rick Steves tells you what bus to get on. And uh, or 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 don't take a bus for this part. Take a take a taxi. So it's the it's a little transportation advice that we found very valuable. And there is a several of Rick Steves books are right on the wall. And 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 I usually you know when I do planning for a trip seven or eight months early, I get a copy of the book from the library to do the advanced planning, and then I'll usually actually buy a copy of the book. The month before we go, so that we have, you know, we have the very latest information. But the library books are so wonderful to do the advanced planning, and uh, you know, to get the advanced planning right, then you're you're halfway home to having a great trip. Any questions uh, from the uh, our virtual attendees? Not yet. Okay. Uh, well, any other questions or comments from here? The only other thing I wanted to mention is I actually. Chiseled out pieces of that wall. Well, yes. It's one of my most prized because I didn't care. It was little box that I ended up getting to carry around the room. <laughs> People took portions of the wall. Uh, and it's important, you know, uh, you know, they realize belatedly they want to keep part of the wall up, you know, not only for tourism, but but also to send the message of what life was like and the you know, the number of people that died trying to get to freedom. Uh, you know, it, it seems like every generation or two, we forget 
the, you know, some of the traumas of the past. And we have to, be, you know, when we see something like the re re Ukraine war, we get re-reminded of, of, of the evils of, uh, you know, war and the dangers of war and uh, company, countries that want to expand their borders by war. We forget that sometimes. And uh, it's, th th that wall could be reminding us of the, uh, the difficulties those people faced. I'm uh, delighted to be here and uh, uh, keep traveling, but travel light. You know, if the, the last piece of advice I'll give, if you're taking a riverboat cruise, like Viking or some of these others, it doesn't matter how much you pick because they typically pick you up at the airport, take you to the boat, you, you sail along, and then most people are go back from the boat to the airport and fly home. But if you're taking the trains like we did, uh, you want to pack light because if you have a big suitcase, it's going to be in your lap because the only place to put a suitcase now is under the seat in front of you. So you want to travel with like an, an airplane carry-on bag, and maybe you could have a little backpack that you put on the shelf above your head. But if you have a big luggage, there's no other place to put it anymore. It has It's in your lap. It can't be on the aisle. So, so pack light. And everything I wear, I can basically wash overnight, and it will be dry in the morning. So thank you again for being here. Uh, have, a, uh, have a great time, great holidays. And again, brochures are up here uh, if you're uh, interested in uh, more information. Hi. Oh, yes, there you go.